seminar today. Um, our uh, today's talk is on issues with increasing the loadability of high voltage transmission lines by Dr. John Lehman. Um, Dr. Lehman has 20 years of experience in power systems analysis and design. He is currently a principal engineer in the Electrical Studies Group at Power Engineers Inc. Uh, his responsibilities include leading engineering teams and performing analysis and design of energy infrastructure. His technical interests are electromagnetics, power systems transients, transmission line design, equipment failure investigation, numerical methods, insulation coordination, and power systems planning. Uh, Dr. Lehman is a member of SIGRE and a senior member of IEEE. He earned his undergraduate and master's degrees in electrical engineering from University of Idaho in 2001 and 20, uh, 2010 respectively. He completed his PhD at Washington State University earlier this year. His research emphasis was in high voltage transmission line electromagnetics. So with that, uh, I hand it over to you. John, go ahead. <clears throat> OK, thank you. Um, glad to be with you all today. So the uh, the title of the, the presentation has, has changed a little bit. I, uh, this is really a an overview of the research work that, that I did at WSU, um, having graduated in May. And uh, of course, uh, PhD dissertations have a big fancy title, so I, I boiled this down a little bit more to a practical, uh, manageable title today. So we'll be talking about um, the work we did to advance design methods, electrical design methods for, for high voltage transmission lines. Uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Olson, um, uh, an emeritus professor at WSU, is, is my uh, my advisor and industry sponsors included American Electric Power, uh, AEP. They're one of the largest uh, electric utilities in, in the US. And then uh, my, my employer, Power Engineers Incorporated. A little bit of background just to help you, for those of you that, uh, that aren't as familiar with electrical design tasks for, for high voltage transmission line. I've got a couple of slides to give you some orientation. So the electrical studies that, that we perform for transmission line design do a couple of things. First, they, they quantify the uh, severity of the electrical stresses that, that you might experience. That could include things like switching transients, which, which is what we'll focus on today. But you also have um, lightning exposures, contamination exposures, et cetera. The studies help you select the insulation levels that you need to establish uh, a satisfactory reliability of the transmission line. They help you optimize against cost. You could build a line that never flashes over, but but that's going to be cost prohibitive. And then finally, the studies help demonstrate compliance with electrical standards and um, uh, permitting requirements. So a, a quick list of, of studies that you would typically perform for transmission line design include those shown on screen. So I've got uh, line constants calculation where you characterize the impedance. Uh, Assessing the electrical losses, which is typically an economic analysis and net present value considerations. The line rating, uh, that's how much power you can push down the line. Insulation coordination is the process of selecting the uh, air gap clearances, air gap spacing between conductors, as well as the, um, the insulators that hold the conductors up. Um, with respect to switching surge lightning and contamination performance. Uh, corona performance. Uh, corona produces audible noise and radio interference effects. We have uh, electric and magnetic field profiles, and these are um, limits established in industry based on historical uh, best estimates of impact on, on human health, etc. There's AC interference, which is examining how the um, uh, electromagnetic coupling from the transmission line affects adjacent facilities like railroads or other transmission lines. And then electrostatic contact currents, <clears throat> excuse me, is a, a human safety consideration. So if there's a large metallic object underneath the transmission line, it can have capacitive coupling uh, to the transmission line. And a person who touches that, that object, such as a vehicle, uh, could experience some um, AC current flow. And then finally, communications interference. Uh, transmission lines and towers can interact with uh, AM radio broadcasts and, and cause distortion. So that's a quick list of the typical study suite for particularly for high voltage AC transmission lines. Now the the uh, components that I have underlined all have a, a common basis, which is the the electric field. 
and and that's going to be the focus of our our, our uh, discussion today. This infographic, I guess, it, it illustrates or tries to to illustrate the approach to design in in our industry today. On the right hand side, we've got um, a representation of, of in-service experience. Long-term experience gives us the best idea of how a design performs, but it takes a long time. Now, many of the, the standards that utilities use are based on um, long-term in-service experience. But um, in, in today's environment, there is more push to uh, refine transmission line design. For example, developers um, are willing to consider novel structures as they try to cut costs and, and maximize power. So when you don't have that long-term in-service experience, then you have to rely on analytical methods or high voltage testing. The high voltage testing is costly and fairly limited in scope. Um, the problem with many of the historical analytical methods though is, is uh, they're relatively inefficient. There's a lot of iteration that has to happen. The margins are not well quantified and it's very weakly linked to capacity considerations, which of course is, is one of the primary reasons for building a transmission line in the first place is to give you capacity. So what's that relationship between capacity and the uh, transient or corona performance? So the, the research really focused on trying to improve the analytical methods for, for transmission line design. As, a, as an illustration of the overall concept of the research, uh, I'm going to discuss a quick analogy that, that is the uh, transatlantic cable. So back in the, uh, the mid-1800s when, when the telegraph was, was quickly spreading throughout the world, um, they identified the need to, to be able to communicate more effectively across continents. And so they, they uh, worked on the, the first transatlantic cable, which as you can see here, might be difficult for you to see, but extends from Newfoundland to uh, Ireland. And it was, a, it was a monumental effort to get that, uh, to get that cable built. Uh, today's equivalent would be billions of dollars worth of effort. effort. The, the first cable in 1858, which is shown on screen here, achieved one word per 10 minutes. And uh, in an effort to improve their transmission rate, they turned the voltage up and it ended up flashing over somewhere in the Atlantic and they, they had to abandon that cable after only two weeks of operation. Six years or nine years later, um, eight years later, they laid the second cable, which was a uh, another attempt based on some lessons learned and some discussions, some debates that were going back and forth about the best way to build these cables and it only achieved one word per minute. And ultimately what the problem was with both of these cables is the, the scientists and engineers at the time were focused on what was going on inside the conductor. Uh, this was expressed by a group of men known as the Maxwellians, they were the men who consolidated Maxwell's equations. Fitzgerald said that according to Maxwell's view, there is a great deal more going on outside the conductor than inside of it. And Oliver Heaviside made a similar statement. And ultimately it was, it was Heaviside who formulated the, the telegrapher's equations. And if you look at these equations, particularly the inductance, the capacitance, and the conductance terms, those are all really uh, more descriptive of, of what's going on outside the conductors. Once they understood that, um, they were able to establish the conditions which allowed um, the uh, dis uh, distortion on the, tr on the telegraph cables to be significantly reduced. And at that point, um, long distance communications really took off. Uh, similarly, in, in the high voltage industry, there's, there's been this historical approach to focusing on power flow in the wires, current in the wires. And we, we see the external electric and magnetic fields as unavoidable byproducts um, of that operation, radio interference, audible noise, and health effects from, from electric and magnetic fields. So Dr. Olson had done some, some research earlier and was able to show that there is a, a, a link um, using the electric field between capacity and, and reliability and these other study parameters that we just mentioned. In other words, let's use the electric field 
as a tool for design because it unites all of these and you don't have to study study them all disparately and then iterate and recalculate. You can address them in a more united fashion. And, and so that's the, the thrust of, of this research. I mentioned before that, that we have um, developers who are willing to go with non-traditional designs. Other drivers here are the fact that the, the grid is, is aging, um, and that's uh, all over the world, but particularly here in the US. The uh, report card that just came out for the US gave the infrastructure a C minus, which is actually up from a D minus uh, in 2015, but there's still a lot of work to go. A lot of lines are nearing their capacity limits, and, and a lot of utilities are starting to look at things like electric vehicle deployment and realizing that that's going to put a significant strain on the existing transmission grid. Also, it's much more getting much more difficult to permit new transmission corridors, which, which means it's more important that we make better use of existing corridors. So all these things combine to, to really make um, the, uh, the effort worthwhile to refine analytical designs for, for high voltage transmission lines. So in, in Dr. Olson's previous research, um, as I mentioned, he, he, he drew um, a relationship between the electric field uh, uniformity and the capacity of the transmission line. And uh, I've, I've included that as a reference at the end of the document, so you can go and look at the details. But basically, you relate surge impedance loading, which is a measure of capacity, um, to equations that are written in terms of the electric field. And an illustration of that is, is shown on screen now, where we have on the left a, a highly non-uniform field, and on the right, we have more uniform configurations. The more uniform you have your field, the, the higher your capacity. However, um, to get the best uh, uniformity has a negative impact on critical flashover voltage. You either have uh, bigger conductor bundles or your conductors are closer, closer together to achieve that, that uh, uniformity. And so there's a trade-off then between capacity and critical flashover voltage. Historically, um, historically, it's been determined or found through through operational uh, data and, and in-service practice that that your switching over voltage performance is typically better than than predicted with uh, EMTP type simulations. So we wanted to be able to model this better. Um, also, historically, sorry, historically, the approach for analyzing transient over voltages was fairly spatially coarse, and we wanted to improve that and see if it actually made a difference. Um, and so the objectives then were to, uh, the ob objectives of the first part of the research were to account for corona losses in the transient over voltage profile, um, evaluate a higher spatial, spatial resolution for the transient over voltage profile, and we had to be able to do this in large batch simulations. This uh, image that you're seeing on screen is a simplified transient for line energization of a three-phase transmission line. So it's um, zero volts here, then we close the circuit breakers and energize the line, and that produces a transient that's at some per unit level above nominal. Um, that shape and the severity of the transient changes based on um, factors such as the length of the line, the geometry of the line, the, the point on wave where the circuit breakers close. And so standard practice is to do batch simulations. So this image on screen shows um, two batches of 500 simulations. The blue here on the left is, is a line to ground distribution and the, the one on the right is a line to line uh, over voltage distribution. So you can see we get a, a bell-shaped curve. And the way this works is you establish a, a distribution, like uh, illustrated ideally here with this red curve. And then you identify or calculate the insulation strength curve. And what the, what the blue line says is, what's the probability that I flash over as voltage gets higher and higher? And, and eventually, the voltage gets high enough that the probability of flash over is, is one. Um, and then the stress curve, this transient over voltage profile says, okay, if I run a huge batch of simulations with 
with varying poll closing times and other factors, then I will have a bell-shaped curve, a normal distribution or a skewed normal distribution. And it's going to have some maximum um, above which I, I just won't see any transients above that point. It's where these two curves overlap. It's where the non-zero portion of these two curves overlap is, is the real risk of flashover. And so that tells us that it's the, the high end of the transient overvoltage profile that contributes the most to risk of flashover, which, which is intuitive. That makes, that makes sense. So given all that, um, we had the following specifications for this transient overvoltage analysis. It had to be capable of a wide frequency band, um, had to be able to handle the nonlinear coronal losses, which we've mentioned, uh, because those will attenuate the switching surge, and that happens at the high end um, of the transient overvoltage distribution, which is the important part to look at. We wanted the high spatial, re spatial re resolution. It had to be capable of modeling a realistic case, which is a bundled multi-conductor transmission line with uh, multiple phases, and then bulk simulation was necessary. So given all those criteria, we decided to use the finite difference time domain approach. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time on that. That's uh, It's a known method. What, what we contributed here is that we extended it to include um, uh, extended the, th the bundled three-phase case to include the dynamic coronal losses um, and uh, uh, make it capable of bulk simulation so we could do statistical analysis. On screen is an example result, um, set of results. So this is um, 500 different simulations of a 100 kilometer line energization. So we're energizing the line at the left end, which is zero miles from, from the end where we close the circuit breaker. At the far end of the line, at 100 kilometers, the circuit breaker is open, so we're getting wave reflections off of that end of the line. And you see that the voltages are, are clamped down to some extent at this end. That's due to an arrestor that's placed it at that end of the line. At any location along the line, then, we could take a cross section and look at the uh, um, five, we could look at 500 or more in this case, 500 data points that show us what the voltage statistics will be at that at that location. This is an example of a line to line case. Um, we're measuring the voltages between phases. Uh, you'll notice that there is no drop off here at the far end, um, which indicates, uh, as is typical, that, that your line to line exposures are not um, effectively clamped by by arrestors. We were particular, particularly interested in the line-to-line -line case um, uh, because high surge impedance lines or, or compact transmission lines are being looked at more and more to improve the uh, capacity that you push down a given corridor. And so the line-to-line -line case often becomes the controlling case for flashover as you get those uh, phase conductors closer and closer together to increase your capacity. So the approach we took for accounting for the corona losses is summarized here on screen. Basically on the left, we, we show a finite element cross section of an actual three phase bundle. And we drew equivalence between that and a single larger diameter conductor. And the equivalence is drawn in the capacitance. In other words, the single uh, conductor um, provides the same effective capacitance as that of the bundled case. And we come up with an equivalent electric field that corresponds to an equivalent corona onset voltage. So whereas the corona onset for the uh, the bundled case might be somewhere, let's say for a 500 kV transmission line, it might be somewhere near um, 550 kV or something like that. The equivalent is going to have a much low, lower corona onset. Um, but again, it's just for establishing equivalence. What that allows us to do is to calculate an effective increase in diameter of the conductor that will give that effective capacitance. So dynamically, we are watching the voltage as it's calculated with the finite difference time, to, time domain method. If the voltage goes above the corona, the equivalent corona onset, then we determine the effective capacitance and the equivalent diameter of this new 
conductor that models the behavior of the corona. And the, the result of that, as you can see here on screen, was um, uh, what we had hoped to see and matched fairly well with data we had from, from Bonneville Power. Uh, let's look at the solid lines first. So the solid brown line is without corona loss and the solid blue line is with corona loss. And it's not a huge attenuation, but it's actually significant when you start looking at the flashover rate. Now the top solid curves are the maxima. In other words, we plucked the, the worst case at every point along the transmission line. Um, to confirm that wasn't just due to spurious or, or only extreme cases, we also looked at the 98th percentile, which is often used for insulation coordination analysis, and that's the dash line. So even in the 98th percentile, there is a, a significant difference in the calculated transient overvoltage. Um, in other words, including the corona losses in the transient over voltage profile um, allows us to, to better match what, what we see in practice um, in overhead line design. This slide illustrates the importance of the uh, high resolution, high spatial, spatial resolution. Uh, when I was first taught to do transient over voltage analysis and, and statistical analysis, for transmission line design, I was told that you typically will do between five and 10 voltage measurements along the transmission line. So for this example, we've got a 250 kV transmission line and the gray lines represent where we would traditionally put uh, voltage probes um, uh, to determine the voltage profile of the line. And the, the voltage profile then that you would get is illustrated by this dashed red line. Now, for most of the line, that's a, a relatively decent representation, but you can see that we we would definitely have missed this peak, which happens in that last quarter of the distance of the transmission line. Now, even if we even if we broke it up into ten probe locations, you'd see we we'd probably have it set where um, where this dashed gray line is. We would still miss the worst case peak which is a, a very important thing to know as you're establishing your insulation profiles. So, so we found that it is, it is definitely beneficial to use a high spatial resolution to resolve the, the, the profile of the transmission line. And uh, that will clearly be important if you're trying to really refine the, the insulation levels. Okay, so then the, the second objective having now refined the transient over voltage profiles is to assess the, the critical flash over voltage. Once you have that, then you can do a better analysis of, of the actual flash over risk. In particular, we were focused on phase to phase flash over uh, between conductors of high surge impedance transmission lines, though, though what we'll talk about here could, could certainly be extended to any standard transmission line design, um, also to line to ground cases. The objective required the following. We had to establish a method that was dependent on the electric field characteristics between the, the phases. Present day practice is, is usually to use empirical formulas and, and while they're, they're fairly good, they, they don't have the nuance to look at um, the, the real detailed behavior of the transmission line electric field. So that was, that was very important for us. Um, it had to be capable of modeling the, the space charge and image charge effects. So when, a, when an arc develops, begins to develop between phase conductors, uh, space charge exists in that region between the, the phase bundles. And those charges create image effects in the conductors as well as ground. And so we needed to be able to take those into account. And that, that meant that inher inherently we needed, sorry, we inherently needed a 3D capable model. Uh, we wanted to minimize empirical constants. Um, in addition to uh, equations that, that don't rely on the electric field, the empirical uh, formulas that we use today have um, multipliers that, that try to take into account um, things like bundle configuration, um, and uh, environmental uh, considerations. 
we wanted to avoid those and be much more rooted in the physics rather than empirical uh, constants. So what I have on screen now is a uh, simple illustration of the streamer and leader that, that will develop um, prior to complete bridging of an arc across uh, conductors. So look at this in two ways. Here on, on part A of this image at the top, we've got a positive conductor on the left and a negative electrode on the right. As the voltage exceeds the corona onset voltage, you develop a small streamer. And if the voltage continues to rise, eventually a, a leader um, is formed. So that's a, a thin plasma channel uh, that is highly conductive. And extending out from the end of that leader is uh, this streamer zone. In, in real life, there is a, a tight coupling between the charge in the streamer zone and the, the charge per unit length that's necessary to create this leader channel. And existing methods that use a, a time domain approach model this with this linkage in place. In other words, they, they do a, an incremental time step, calculate the, the change in charge in the streamer from one time step to the next, and then use that to increment the, the leader. So you end up having to model through the entire range of travel of the leader and the streamer from, from positive electrode to negative electrode. Um, and then you do that for different voltage levels. And, and then once you've found the voltage that will get you to the negative electrode, that's, that becomes your, your breakdown voltage, which can be used to calculate critical flashover. Uh, what we decided to do was a, a spatial approach. And again, since we were interested in the, the spatial uniformity of the electric field between, between phase conductors, we wanted to understand how this um, leader streamer process evolved in the context of the spatial variation of the electric field. So in order to do that, we had to uh, develop a method that used charge simulation. And so here on screen, I'm showing a, a representative model um, of a, a streamer region and a leader region. And with charge simulation method, you establish known voltage points and charge locations, and then you solve for the charges that give those voltage um, those voltage points or voltage contours. The, the problem we ran into as we started down this road is um, computational burden. For a streamer and a leader, you typically would want about two to 3,000 charge points. And that, that's not a problem, but when you start bringing in um, bundled conductors into the mix and have to discretize charges in the conductors, it becomes very difficult to, to compute. So here's an example uh, where we have six bundles per phase, and we have a, a streamer and leader extending from, um, from the uh, uh, top conductor down to the one at the bottom left. And uh, examples like this, where you need to model a couple hundred meters of, of transmission conductor produce a, a large number of charge points. Uh, if all you're calculating is one or two snapshots, that's that's not a problem because um, we're looking at, oh, between 100 seconds and 1,000 seconds for the range of uh, discretization points that we, we needed. But when you have to, to calculate batches of simulations, that becomes uh, problematic. So we uh, developed a, a new method for applying charge simulation that moves a portion of the problem into um, the spatial frequency domain. And uh, essentially what we have is the problem that's shown on screen. We have multiple, uh, multiple conductors. The charge, um, excuse me, the, the those conductors can be represent, represented with a, a single line charge density, but the problem is that that line charge density is non-uniform. And uh, it's, it's very nice if you can do two-dimensional uniform charge density calculations, that's very quick and efficient. But because we have um, isolated charges near the conductor, and those charges have image effects on the conductor, well, we can't use a two-dimensional uh, approach. Um, and we have the all the image charge effects. So uh, what we did, and, and this is uh, really 
discussed in detail in, in Dr. Olson's uh, textbooks. Um, but you can take a single point charge and you can derive the electric potential along a line due to that point charge. It turns out that that becomes uh, 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 proportional to a modified Bessel function. And that's for a single point charge. And then you can represent a, a uh, line charge density with an infinite series of point charges. And I won't go into the detailed math here. There's lack of time, but, but the, the general problem then is that you end up with a, a convolution function um, to represent the, uh, the full line charge density. However, by moving that to the spatial frequency domain, the convolution becomes uh, a multiplication. And in the end, um, by moving a portion of the problem to the spatial frequency domain, we uh, achieved significant um, improvements in computational um, capability. So what you're looking at on screen is a, uh, a calculation of essentially the, the, the number of computations necessary to inverse a, a dense square matrix, which is what you have in, in charge simulation. It, um, because all the charges interact, um, it's a dense matrix. So if you do that completely in the spatial domain, um, it's, much more, uh, it's much more computationally burdensome. Now, the equations on the left essentially give us the ratio of the computational burden for the all spatial charge simulation method versus the, the Fourier enhanced charge simulation method. And for this example, with 3,000 point charges representing the uh, leader and the streamer and 18,000 plus charges representing the, uh, the conductors, we achieve a, um, a 51 um, a ratio of 51, basically saying that the computational time for the all spatial approach is 51 times longer than the computational time for the, the Fourier enhanced charge simulation approach. And, and this is just for a case with three subconductors um, per phase, so, so a total of nine, nine conductors. And in situations with higher um, subconductor counts, the improvement is, is even greater. Here's an example. So this table shows uh, the uh, time ratio of the all spatial charge simulation method over the Fourier enhanced charge simulation method. And if you have um, a large number of subconductor uh, discretization points relative to the number of charges in um, the region between the phase conductors, it's, it's a huge improvement. Um, for cases where you have a a larger number of charges out in the space between uh, phase conductors, the improvement is not as great, but it's still uh, a significant improvement. So, so this method, this Fourier enhanced charge simulation method, really made it possible for us to do the iterative um, batch cases that were needed to demonstrate what I'll talk about next. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip this slide. So, so this slide now illustrates our, our spatial approach at trying to identify the critical flash over voltage. The example is that of two phase bundles. They each have six subconductors. We're assuming a leader streamer path um, that, that follows the uh, region of highest electric field between the subconductors. And what we do is we, we pick a leader length. So I mentioned before that, that in reality, leader length and, and streamer charge are tightly coupled in real life. Um, for the spatial approach, we, we force those to be separate. So we pick a leader length. Let's focus on this blue curve for the moment. And that's going to be a, a one meter length leader. And then we select a range of streamers that extend from that one meter leader. And in reality, this ratio of streamer charge over uh, leader charge per unit length times length, there can only be one answer, um, one, as we mentioned before, that ratio has to be one in real life. But by decoupling them, we get a feel for how the electric field between conductors starts to affect our leader streamer propagation. If we find a point that exceeds this threshold of one, then we know that, that that's a realistic, that there exists at least one realistic leader streamer combination. In other words, it's a feasible condition. 
if you pick a leader length and streamer length that can never reach this threshold of one, then we know right away that, that there's no feasible condition in that example. So, so now what you can do is run a suite of curves like I've shown here, and we can quickly identify that there is a minimum curve. Now, if we raise that whole family of curves such that the, the lowest point on the curve just reaches one, that becomes our breakdown voltage. Okay, so, so basically the voltage that corresponds to the minimum condition for propagation uh, of that leader streamer system from the positive to the negative electrodes is our breakdown voltage. Uh, that's what we, we postulated. Um, now let's go through some, some results. Uh, I'm going to skip that last slide. Uh, what this slide here is showing is the calculated streamer electric field. Um, that's one of the important parameters. And we took experimental data that was performed by researchers years ago and plugged that into our method and back calculated the, the electric uh, field that's necessary in the streamer to give us that, that answer, that critical flash over voltage. And uh, they all fell within within range. Typically, the electric field for the streamer is between four and, and five and a half um, kV per, per centimeter. So that was a very good result. Uh, this plot here is a result of the of calculation of the phase-to-phase -phase critical flashover voltage. Again, this is for four independent data sets. The colored shapes are the calculated values that correspond to each experimental set. And then the crosses are the actual experimental data that were obtained in the, in the independent studies that we found previously. So pretty good cor correlation, particularly for the first two data sets. Uh, these last two data sets were, were somewhat questionable. They didn't include all the information that we would have liked to have had to really recreate what they did. Um, but the first two had very good information and were consistent with each other. Um, here's another a look at critical flashover voltage as a function of the gap length. Um, again, they, there was very good correlation between these uh, for the experiment, uh, experimental values versus the calculated values. Now, um, I'll note here that, that these last couple of plots we've looked at are um, critical flashover voltage, which is the symbol V50, versus gap length. Uh, the problem with this approach is it doesn't distinguish very well between the different um, uh, geometries that, that were um, used in the experiments. Uh, some of them had more bundles than the others. The gap spacing was different. The, the subconductor sizes were different. One way to, to better differentiate um, between the critical flashover voltages of different geometries is to normalize it by the corona onset voltage. So I'm going to click to this next slide, which is also a gap length on the horizontal axis. But now we've normalized the critical flashover voltage by the corona onset voltage. And you can see that this uh, does a much better job of distinguishing among the different, um, the different data sets. What we found is, is instead of looking at gap length, now let's look at uh, the uh, electric field non-uniformity between the, between the subconductor bundles. And there's a little bit tight, tighter grouping, um, which indicates that the electric field non-uniformity was actually a better measure um, for uh, the correlation between what's, what's going on with the field and the, and the overall geometry of the system versus the critical flash, the normalized critical flash over voltage. And this uh, chart here actually shows the distance correlation calculation of critical flash over voltage against various parameters. Now, when you're looking at the non-normalized critical flash over voltage, the gap length clearly dominates. But any, any correlation value above about 0.7 is considered a strong correlation. So when we go to the normalized set, the, the gap length no longer is the, uh, the dominant correlation parameter. Uh, instead, it's the minimum electric field, which which reinforces our approach of of trying to use a, a spatial approach to calculate CFO. Really, it's that minimum electric field that that streamer and leader have to get through 
before they can get um, to the other electrode. Once that once that streamer starts to approach the negative electrode, the strong electric field um, near that electrode reinforces the uh, uh, the breakdown process. So, so really, it's that minimum electric field between phases that represents the barrier that has to be crossed in order for for breakdown to occur. Um, what's also interesting, though, is that the electric field non-uniformity um, has a fairly strong correlation for both the non-normalized and for the normalized critical flash over voltage. In other words, non-uniformity might be a better overall measure of um, a better overall measure to use for establishing critical flashover correlation. Um, wrapping up here, this is the uh, the actual error calculation then that we found between our calculated values and the uh, experimental values. And and what we did here is let me back up a little bit. <clears throat> um, we found an average electric field of the streamer. Um, because if you're if you're going to do this uh, in in real life, you're not going to have the ability. At least we don't currently to really refine the electric field of the streamer for different conditions. But we can find typical values. Like in this case, we used 4.6, which is um, very consistent with with uh, some of the literature that we found. And when we use that um, average electric streamer value and then calculate the critical flashover val values, these are the errors that we would then that we would then see. And I've got three error measures here. Um, I won't take time to talk about the difference, but when we looked at the two best data sets, our error was below 5%, um, which is, is actually quite good for uh, comparison between calculation and experimental data. Um, ultimately, what this um, will hopefully allow us to do is something similar to what you see on the on the screen here, where we use electric field as our common parameter, particularly electric field non-uniformity. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see um, critical flashover voltage. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have surge impedance loading. So very quickly, just at a glance, we can, we can find a, a, a relationship between the surge impedance loading and the transient performance of a line given different bundle configurations, et cetera. Um, and it, it can really optimize design and make it a much more uh, rapid approach, much more efficient. Um, so in, in conclusion, uh, <clears throat> we, we were able to refine the, the finite difference time domain um, approach to transient over voltage profile development. <clears throat> we found that, that a high spatial resolution of your transient over voltage profile is important. Um, we, we were able to develop a computationally efficient method for analyzing charge simulation uh, situations that included uh, bundled subconductors and non-uniform linear charge densities. Um, and then we successfully applied that, that method to model uh, leader streamer propagation in face-to-face -face conditions. Um, and with that, I'll uh, um, just point out that, that the uh, First paper here on, on my references list was uh, a previous paper that was published by Dr. Olson and, and a colleague in China that established the idea of electric field non-uniformity and capacity um, against uh, critical flashover voltage. And then the, the next two papers are papers that, that have been published in uh, energies and IEEE transactions that cover the, the finite difference approach and the Fourier enhanced charge simulation method. And then we just recently submitted a third paper that covers the uh, the face-to-face -face critical flash over voltage modeling using the charge simulation method. And, and we're uh, waiting to get review comments back on that. So any any questions from the group? Or, or I guess before we jump into questions, Dr. Olson, is there anything you'd like to add? And if you're if you're saying anything, uh, Dr. Olson, your your mute's on. I know he he maybe had to step away early, so maybe we'll come back to to him if he's if he's hearing us. Any so any any questions then from the group? Hey, thanks, John. Uh, very interesting presentation. We have one question that Dr. Olson has answered, but I'll ask uh, uh, still with you. So why are uh, medium length leader streamer combinations more favorable? the long or short lens when calculating flashover voltage? 
Um, why are can you can you repeat the question? It was it was talking about that slide that you just skipped over where there's kind of a U shape between. Yeah, that one. I was just wondering why that is. Oh, OK. Um, so why why does this curve have the why do these curves have the shape that they do essentially? Right. Yeah. So in in the region closer to the conductors, whether that's on the positive polarity side or the negative polarity side, the electric field is 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 very strong, and so it's it's easier to uh, develop the ionizations that that help the the streamer that help the streamer and the leader to propagate. Um, in between. Uh, kind of out in the middle between the phase conductors, the electric field is lower, and so the opposite is true. And so it's it's harder for the leader and streamer to get past that point because um, ionizations aren't aren't as strong. That's that's a simple explanation. But does that answer your question? Yeah, I, th I think so. So what then? What is the key? What are those distances? You know, like okay. the different colors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So on on the right hand side, these are the leader lengths that that we have selected. So for example, uh, let's just take the red curve here in the middle. I have selected a three meter leader. In other words, I've established that. And then the, the points along here represent the total leader plus the streamer length. OK, so on, on this data point right here, I've got a three meter leader and a one meter streamer. And that gives my total leader plus streamer length of, of four meters. Um, but in this particular example, we, we could say that, that nothing on this curve, none of the assumed leader and streamer conditions that we've assumed are going to be viable uh, because there's no point on there that exceeds this ratio of streamer charge to total leader propagation charge of, of one. And, and, and out in the middle, that's worse because the electric field is weaker. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. We have Dr. Olson here. Dr. Olson, would you like to add something? <clears throat> okay, if you're speaking, you're muted. Okay. Uh, Amika, were you asking me a question? I, I no, uh, uh, no, John mentioned that uh, if you would like to add something to the discussion today, and which yeah. is making no, I think I, I was I lost my connection just for a few minutes and I missed. Uh, I think John responded to Andrew Cannon. Is that right? Um, yeah. I hope that uh, I had also responded through the chat and I hope that uh, the two of those answers would be helpful. <laughs> I hope they matched. Oh, well, <laughs> I think they do. Yeah, I, I think I didn't completely understand Andrew's question. Um, because it seemed to me that he was saying that there were certain ratios of either small or large values of uh, either leader and streamer length. And I think what I pointed out, I think was consistent with John, and that was that uh, uh, basically you start out with a certain uh, streamer length or leader length, and you look for streamer lengths that are consistent uh, with that, that will allow growth of the leader. And then you... Um, uh, and then if you find those con that condition, you then uh, uh, assume that the leader can in fact grow and you repeat the process. I think that's equivalent to what John just said, but I missed a little part of it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. You know, in the in the in the uh, alternate time domain approaches that others have used. And if you're looking at this plot on screen, it would basically just track right along the dashed line and it would go from positive electrode all the way to negative electrode and there, there would be nothing in that approach that really told you what was going on in the middle what what's different out in the middle that that's out in the end i mean if if your voltage isn't high enough then you'll get to a point where you can no longer satisfy the equation and you just stop and and so you you could probably back into uh, this condition but one of the problems with that approach is is if you get close to the negative electrode you start getting a a negative directed streamer. Um, and using this approach, we, we don't really need to model that side. So so this is a little bit easier in terms of having the ability to, uh, to neglect 
the streamer that's that's building up on the negative uh, negative yeah, electrode. Another thing that's really positive about it, I think, is that um, you basically um, have uh, a smaller number of unknown constants, and so we basically do some calibration based on uh, experimental results for the one that is the most important, uh, and that's the electric field in the streamer region itself. Uh, and then we find out that when we do that, once we've done that, uh, we get some pretty good comparisons with uh, the experimental data. And not only that, but it is consistent with the fundamental physics. Yeah, yep. Yeah, at all points in the analysis, the, the charge simulation method is doing the full calculation of the electric field in, in the region. The, the slide I skipped over il illustrates what um, Dr. Olson was just saying, that we, we do have parameters in there that are associated with discretization, but in the sensitivity analysis that we we looked at, um, for the situations of interest, those parameters don't change much at all. So the, the dominant parameters really are just the voltage, the streamer electric field, and then the amount of charge that it takes to grow the leader. And that's a, that's a very well established parameter already. Um, other methods that use the time domain approach are, are relying on other types of, of constants and empirical values to, to get a result. Yeah, and what we like about this, I think more than anything, is that it identifies a minimum electric field uh, and shows that basically the real issue is can the prop, can, is the electric field high enough for this, uh, le this uh, arc to proceed or not? or what, what, under what conditions does it stop? Because we find that uh, at the same time, the, um, the non-uniformity of the field, the, 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 the less uniform it is, uh, the, or as I should say, the more uniform it is, the more power we can get down that line, okay? But that then creates a problem for us because it means that we're going to have a lower critical flashover voltage. And that I think is the fundamental contribution of that original paper and John has just fleshed out a lot of that uh, data and made it more I mean we've been able to quantify it better Excellent. yep thank you for the explanation I think uh, that clarified a lot I have a good question about the charge simulation that was a very interesting visual uh, along with the interesting method and the computational advantage that you showed um, maybe can you briefly talk about the Fourier enhanced charge simulation what is it you know done to um, get the computational advantages and are there you know uh, certain uh, is it the exact method or transformation method or there are certain approximation errors involved here and any uh, more discussion on that point <laughs> Yeah, um, so so we are using the discrete fast Fourier transform. So there, there is some um, discretization error, but we do have control over, you know, essentially we're taking these, these uh, transmission line conductors and breaking them into line charge segments. Um, and, and then those segments are calculated using this uh, inverse fast Fourier transform. So, so there is some discreti discretization involved, uh, which includes, you know, inherently some approximation. But, but a couple of these other slides that I, I skipped over, um, let me go back. Find it. So, so here's an example where we model the transmission structure. Uh, we're not modeling breakdown in this case. It's just a, a steady state. Um, high voltage transmission line with transmission structure. And we're, we're deploying the point charges to represent the structure itself. And then we're discretizi discret discretizing the, uh, the phase conductors. And we compare that to finite element method. Um, and you can see that we get very good results. So it, it's very close. Um, if you're very, very close to the conductor, you start seeing the effects of that discretization. Um, but since we don't care as much about what's going on right close to the conductor, it's out between phases, it's actually very accurate. Um, and just due to the time constraints, uh, and Amika, maybe uh, we could take more of that conversation offline, but I can also forward you the paper that goes through the, the process in detail. But like I said, it's 
is essentially taking the equations from Bob's book and applying the Fourier transform to these convolution integrals uh, to get summations that are um, multiplied instead of convolution. Um, and then you apply some, some matrix operations in the frequency domain, and then you apply the inverse Fourier transform to the result there, get back to the spatial domain, apply one more matrix operation, and then you have your, your result. So that's a very high level description of it. Um, so that, that's excellent. That's basically uh, taking the advantage of uh, uh, representation in the frequency domain to, or after the Fourier transformation to uh, simplify, not to simplify, to actually reduce the computational cost, right? And make these simulations possible. It's very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, if you could please forward me the paper, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd be happy to. Anamika, okay. that's correct. Uh, that's correct. And I'll just also add that when we say that Fourier transform domain, we're not talking the time time to uh, frequency, but spatial frequency, basically, yes. as opposed to time temporal frequency. Yep. Um, I, I'll take some time to understand the full detail, but but I get some intuition. Thanks for the explanation. Um, OK, any other questions from the audience students? All right, so we have a couple of minutes, so um, I'll ask a broader question, John. Uh, would you like to give some final takeaways uh, for our power systems students, researchers working in this domain? Um, any uh, thoughts on uh, how the industry is changing and what uh, we should be paying attention to as a power systems researcher uh, looking in the, into this domain 10, 15 years from now? Yeah. So since we have limited time, I'll, I'll give you what I feel is one of the most important things. Um, there's a lot of expertise in our industry that's retiring. And uh, folks like like Dr. Olson and others who, who really did a lot of very excellent work in establishing the, the theoretical basis for a lot of things. And I feel like uh, a lot of engineers coming out of, of the university are, are not um, walking out with the grasp of those of those fundamentals. So um, it's what I really look for in, in when I'm hiring individuals. It's it's what I look for in in training new new engineers is is really helping them understand the the fundamentals. Um, uh, it wasn't really till I started studying under Dr. Olson that I really started to feel a bit of a grasp for the importance of electromagnetics. Right when you're in your undergraduate, it's like uh, I don't know if I need to know that stuff ever. But it's been so valuable in in my career. Um, particularly as, as I've gotten into more interesting things. If you can establish those fundamentals, then then you become a go-to person uh, and interesting work comes your way. So that's that's a high level advice, but I, but I think it's important. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so we are at the 12 noon clock. Thank you so much, John, for the presentation today. We learned a lot. Thanks for spending time with us. Have a great day, everyone. We'll adjourn the call for today. Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Bye. Bye.